I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis. Uh, I'm here with uh, some colleagues and some some folks from the annotated community. Yes, let me first say the annotated community. What is it? So this is a really broad uh, group of folks from different institutions. I'm sure you, these logos are probably too small to even see, um, but these are um, representing the institutions that are um, kind of working uh, with social annotation and in deeper ways. And so we have uh, representatives from some of these institutions here today to talk about what they're doing uh, with social annotation. And then we're going to try it out ourselves. The rough shape of the agenda today, Jeremy's going to spend, my colleague Jeremy's going to spend a little bit of time uh, just at the beginning, making sure everybody understands what we're talking about uh, around social annotation. Then we're going to hear from a few practitioners um, about just some short stories about how they use it in their, uh, in their context. And then we're going to get to the highlight of the day, which is going to be we're all going to annotate together and socially read together um, a text that our special guest, Flower Darby, who's keynoter at um, OLC Accelerate that's happening over the next couple of weeks has picked out for us. Wow, that was a really complicated sentence. Um, and so um, we'll, 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 we'll both make sure you understand how you can annotate and then we'll, we'll start to have a discussion um, over that text. Uh, that flowers picked out um, during the second half of the show. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton to my colleague, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Dean, VP of Education here at Hypothesis, and he's gonna get us all on the same page. Okay, take it away, Jeremy. Thanks, Nate. Uh, thanks to LC for having us back. Uh, we love our partnership with Online Learning Consortium. And uh, thanks to Nate and his team for putting together a great, a great program for this morning. It's exciting to uh, hear from practitioners and then get to practice ourselves. Uh, I'm going to give a general introduction and then pass the baton. Um, as Nate said, I'm Jeremy Dean from Hypothesis. Uh, I'm a former English professor by train, actually, so I come from the academic space. Uh, and at some point, uh, not in relationship to online teaching, in relationship to the face-to-face -face teaching I was doing during getting while I was getting my PhD at UT Austin, I got in the practice of handing out this poem by Billy Collins uh, on the first day of class alongside the syllabus. We've all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages, we pressed the thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. For me as a student and as a scholar and as a teacher, annotation had been a sort of fundamental and critical practice to my success. And so I believed that uh, you know, encouraging my students to annotate uh, would contribute to their success uh, in my courses. I believe that was so such a fundamental piece of the whole project that we were working on together that I would hand out this poem to try to inspire them uh, on day one. And of course, uh, there's nothing particularly radical about this idea of annotation or innovative uh, about my uh, suggestion of uh, the practice to my students. Uh, it's been around for quite a while, actually probably since before the invention of the book, um, as a means for helping readers uh, engage with their content, uh, better comprehend content that they're reading, and begin to think critically and develop their own ideas and voice uh, around reading and, and content. Um, and so there's nothing particularly new about the idea of, of annotation uh, at all. Um, but it's interesting that as we do move our teaching online and as we move reading online, um, we actually lose this practice in a lot of contexts. We aren't able to uh, claim the margins as, uh, as Billy Collins suggests that, that readers should do. Um, we lose this fundamental critical practice and uh, literacy practice, and we lose it at a time when actually it's, it's even more urgently needed than in the analog uh, world, right? Because uh, education researchers have uh, shown us that students and really everyday readers that, that read online aren't as engaged, they're not retaining as much. Uh, and so we need annotation uh, more than ever uh, when we're reading online. And that's part of what a uh, hypothesis is about is bringing back the margin, but there's a lot more that we can do with this traditional practice of annotation as it moves online. Uh, I've been sharing this quote a lot, especially uh, since the pandemic began um, to try to encourage folks about uh, to give heart to folks that are teaching online for the first time. I imagine this audience is, is not new to online uh, teaching and learning, but, but nonetheless, I think that um, annotation can be a powerful part of the toolkit for online teaching and learning. And I love this quote from Jennifer Howard uh, at, the at the Chronicle of Higher Education several years ago. Online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. 
And so this is actually a little different from the traditional notion of marginalia or, or, or you know, uh, annotations, which are kind of a private practice uh, between a, an individual reader and, and, and you know, the, the margin of a page that they're reading. Uh, because one of the more powerful things that can happen to, social, to annotation as it moves online is that it becomes social. Um, and I've been sharing this since the pandemic because I think it, it really emphasizes the communal aspect or the communal potential of sharing the margins as a space to uh, engage with each other and engage uh, with text. So this is the vision of annotation that we have here at Hypothesis as we bring marginalia into the 21st century. Any website, I guess, do we have to stop doing that? It's sort of, I guess the first decade of the 21st century, you could sort of say that and it was radical, but now it's like 20 minutes in, uh, 20, 20 uh, years in, it's no longer, you can't say that. But anyway, how about we just say annotation 2.0 or marginalia 2.0 and borrow that kind of um, phrasing. Uh, any website, article, ebook, document, piece of multimedia can have multiple layers of annotation. So you can still have that layer of marginal notes, a uh, private marginal notes, but there are other layers uh, that, that, that can be added uh, as well. So there's a public layer, uh, which I suppose we'll be engaging with today, right, Nate, as we annotate flowers, chosen readings together, right? We're going to be sharing our notes. I mean, we could take private notes, um, but we're also going to be annotating publicly together seeing each other's annotations. And because it's a public layer, others could come to that text you know, tomorrow, uh, next week, uh, six months from now, and see those annotations because they're part of a public layer. Uh, we could also, if we chose, uh, create private groups for reading and annotating and circumscribe the community to a particular set of, of individuals, say a classroom or a group of colleagues. Uh, so there's a public layer, private note, note layer, and then something in between a sort of private group for reading and annotating. Um, and this is what the hypothesis tool uh, enables readers uh, to do. I'm gonna share three top level takeaways that I've gathered from students and instructors uh, over the years um, uh, about their uh, feedback uh, on the use of hypothesis and social annotation uh, in the classroom. The first goes back to that kind of nothing new aspect of annotation that you know, annotation or hypothesis makes reading active. Um, I'm sure the idea of active learning is, is not a, a new concept to most of the audience here that, that's at an OLC conference, um, but this is about, you know, the active reading sort of uh, piece of that active learning uh, space that we might try to create with our classrooms. Um, and I do like to point out when I share this slide that one of the neat things, I think this is true about, you know, a lot of the digital tools that we use in the classroom, uh, not just hypothesis, not just annotation, is that the ways that students can be active, the ways that they can be uh, engaged, the ways that they can demonstrate their learning and their uh, increasing expertise on a topic are really expanded, I believe, uh, in the online context. So just as an example here, you can see students engaging with a poem using memes, right? Not just written text, uh, but images, uh, video, uh, uh, hyperlinks and other things. So these are multimodal uh, writing that can take place in an annotation like as in other online contexts. And I actually think Nate has said it best uh, <clears throat> in another context that really every annotation with hypothesis is like a little mini website, right? So depending on your course and how you're leveraging the tool, you could be basically doing a mini lesson in web design <laughs> for every, you know, for your for students in their annotations. Again, you don't have to, you can also just keep it at the textual level. But all those you know, rich multimedia possibilities are available to you as different ways to be active, different ways to engage with content. This uh, uh, feedback is, I think, is a new aspect of annotation. Because of course, marginalia for much of history, notes uh, and books for much of history, except of course, if you're sharing books or coming across a book, and, and Billy Collins actually talks about this, you know, taking a book out from the library and finding somebody else's uh, annotations in it. So they've been social to an extent and visible to others. Um, but there is an increased visibility with, um, with social annotation, right? And so this idea that hypothesis or social annotation makes reading visible, I think is, is pretty powerfully new. Of course, when I handed out that Billy Collins poem, um, I you know, didn't tell my, I didn't check that my students annotated, I didn't tell them best practices for annotation. I didn't talk about how to harvest their annotations for some summative uh, assessment. Um, I graded a paper uh, three or four weeks later, right? Um, and of course, contained within that paper, within the written exercise that I was grading, um, was uh, is the result of a lot of processes, reading, comprehending, 
uh, commenting, annotating, critical thinking that are developed over the course of those weeks before the summative assessment. Um, and part of a process is constitutive of that uh, 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 summative assessment that was sort of largely invisible to me back in the day when I was teaching in the classroom at UT. And now that process can be visible. You can see, first of all, you can see that the students have done the reading, right? Because their foot fingerprints are over all over and you can see their, their early ideas. You can see how they're engaging. You can see where they're confused. You can see where they're in, uh, inspired and uh, you know, help them along with a particular line of inquiry. This can inform, of course, your understanding of where a student is at in your course um, and, and then you know, reaching certain uh, learning outcomes. Um, it also can help you, you know, think about how you design your course or how you prepare for your, your class meeting because you have this, this, this body of evidence in their, in their, in their annotations and you know, where, even where they didn't annotate might be interesting. Uh, as Lee Scalarup has, has uh, said when she's talked about hypothesis, that the, the gaps where people haven't annotated can be just as interesting sometimes as where they have. And then finally, the idea that annotation or social annotation hypothesis makes reading uh, social. Uh, this is the thing that students take away uh, as, we, uh, as we can gather from the surveys they complete, um, that you know, the, the social aspect is what they really appreciate and enjoy and find valuable. Uh, the number one takeaway they always say is that they learn from their peers um, uh, using the so social annotation. And of course, uh, the sort of testimonials we've heard from students over the past eight months are particularly uh, uh, dramatic, just given the fact that many of them don't have a lot of other social outlets to connect with their classmates uh, because of the pandemic and because campuses have been uh, closed down or, or reduced in capacity. Um, that they found this is a way to stay connected with classmates when they don't have the hallways, the classrooms, possibly even the dorms and other spaces to have those connections. All right, I'm going to speed through if I have time, Nate, just six provocations uh, and then pass it off to uh, to uh, hear oh. from our practitioners, which really, as Nate has said, is the highlight, uh, one of the big highlights of the, of the morning. Yeah, go for it. Cool. Um, so six ways to annotate uh, for and with students. Uh, first, and I've said this already, but um, it's, it's not just about reading. It's not just about annotating. It is about community. Uh, again, I hear again and again from teachers who have come to Hypothesis because they want students to engage deeply with reading, who come away from their use of Hypothesis, praising it for the sort of way that it has helped build and maintain community uh, in their classroom, which again, uh, all the more of an urgent need, I think, um, today as so many of us are, are teaching and learning online. Uh, as uh, Ramey, uh, my colleague Ramey, I'm not sure if he came up with this idea, but it's something that he has uh, propagated for sure, this idea of annotating the syllabus, um, and, and I think can be extended to annotating a lot of other ancillary materials from a course. And I think has added emphasis in this time of the pandemic when we're not handing out the, the syllabus on day one and it's online. Uh, but opening up your course materials, your ancillary course materials like the syllabus to annotation by your students is a very powerful way to get them to just practice using the tool, to show how the tool can be used in different, different ways, and to get feedback on your course. Definitely have heard from instructors who had their students annotate the syllabus and made some adjustments <laughs> as a result of the uh, feedback of students. And so that idea of co-design uh, of a course uh, enabled by hypothesis is is a powerful one. So of course you can just turn on uh, a hypothesis for students and, and see what they do with the, as the marginal space is kind of um, reclaimed uh, for their teaching and learning. Maybe they just use it for private notes. Maybe they choose to ask questions of each other, form little study groups to talk about the reading. Um, I do think the more that you are guiding students or the more that the annotation is socialized, uh, the more powerful. And so some instructors do um, a lot of annotation themselves. Uh, they'll create signposts uh, in difficult readings for, to help guide students through, uh, through a text like, uh, like uh, Virgil guides Dante through, uh, through you know, hell and, and heaven in, in, a, in, a, in, in the inferno. That's what that image there is there. Um, you can pre-populate a text with questions. We see a lot of this happening where a teacher will go in and essentially ask discussion forum type questions in the margins for students to respond to. But of course, students can ask questions themselves, right? And every student's question can be the blooming of a, or the blossoming of a discussion forum that is student driven, right? Rather than a top-down teacher driven kind of discussion. 
Uh, and I think the seminar style, asynchronous seminar style discussion is the strength of hypothesis. Today, you're gonna to be annotating synchronously if you're new to hypothesis, of course, as we work with Flower to annotate together and it can be done synchronously. Um, I think our synchronous time is precious, especially today. Uh, and so I think, you know, and it's perfectly reasonable to use hypothesis synchronously, but I think it's also very powerful to use it asynchronously and have it inform your synchronous time together. Um, and so that's largely how it's used as sort of asynchronous uh, seminar style discussion um, and something along the lines of sort of sitting on the grass together <laughs> with the books open and that kind of cheesy brochure image of what it's like to go to a certain kinds of colleges at least. Um, and then finally, this sort of loops back to number two, any, uh, any artifact from a class, lecture notes, uh, slide deck that can be turned into a PDF with recognizable text um, can be annotated, right? So for larger classes, we do see this sometimes happen. A teacher will you know, uh, turn their lecture notes into something annotatable and, um, and have students annotate that with questions uh, where they're confused about maybe the lecture or connection, can make connections to sort of popular uh, coverage of some of the topics uh, that, that might come up in lecture and things like that. And that, I believe, is my time and my portion of the deck. And I will hand it back to the Master of Ceremonies, Nate Angel. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. I wanted to give people just maybe take a moment and breathe. <laughs> We've, it's, been a, it's been a really, um, you know, I think probably for everyone on this call, if you're, especially if you're um, attending the OLC conference, um, you're probably a person who's been working nonstop since the pandemic started, I mean, I'm sure everybody has, but folks, uh, folks like us who are, are work to support education, you know, have really been working nonstop. Of course, there's all sorts of other things going on in the world that are really trying. And I think it's just it's important to just take a pause and oh, I'm stretching. I'm taking a deep breath and just saying, oh, okay, <laughs> it's okay to just relax for a minute and get into what we're doing right now and um, put aside the worries of the world for a little while. Um, so uh, <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy has let me know that I look a little bit like Steve Jobs today. <clears throat> and I'll just say I do have my, um, my vest on here because in Oregon, it's actually a little bit chilly um, here in the early morning. Um, winter is coming, as they say. Really appreciate um, Jeremy kind of uh, getting us all on the same page uh, about social annotation and sort of the powers that it has. Um, and now it's my uh, pleasure to um, uh, introduce a couple of uh, other people that are gonna um, give you some understanding of how they think about and use social annotation in their work. Um, and I'm really, uh, really happy to have these folks here today. Some of them I met just recently and gotten to know, um, and some, uh, some I've known for a while, um, but uh, they're all people who have really made deep use of social annotation in their work and are kind of just gonna give you a brief understanding of, of how they use it um and then uh we'll actually have them around and we can ask them some questions and stuff before we get started on annotating ourselves so um without further ado i'd like to start out first with um mary klon from university of california san diego among other uh, among other places and mary are you uh you want to check your mic you you came in a little bit late so you didn't have a time to check your audio hello can you hear yes me? yes <laughs> We can hear and see you, great. Um, and so um, <clears throat> Mary uh, is gonna go first and then we're gonna hear from Matt, um, who uh, is really interesting um, because he uses social annotation in the context of math, which many people don't even think about. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll also be hearing from um, Rami Kalir, who uh, it was just uh, named the scholar in residence at Hypothesis and is doing, um, um, kind of uh, leading some uh, formal research around social annotation and its use in in uh, different educational contexts. So um, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, Mary, I don't know if you have anything that you want to share. Um, but if you do, you could take over the screen. And if you don't, that's fine, too. Uh, you could just uh, talk to us. So it's all yours. Take it away, Mary. So I'll up, I guess. Thanks. Um, I'll start off by just talking, I guess. I um, will just wanted to, I guess, share a little bit about how I came to Hypothesis and then how I use it now. Um, so I uh, started using it in my 
undergraduate history classes. So I teach at UC San Diego and at San Diego Miramar College, which um, is a community college here in San Diego. So I have a, a bunch of um, you know different levels in terms of the types of classes I teach. So intro survey all the way up to like an honors uh, seminar kind of class. Um, and I use it in all my classes. <laughs> and I started using it in um, 2018. So I was a really, really new instructor and I came to it as um, someone who had tried to make my students uh, do these readings like secondary source uh, journal article book chapter type readings um, and then answer questions that were multiple choice that I made up from the readings in this reading quiz and <laughs> did not go well at all. Um, so very grateful to the students in my very first class at Miramar who told me that they weren't understanding the readings, they were too challenging, and they just stopped doing the quizzes. And I was like, well, okay, there we go. <laughs> so, um, I knew I had to try something else. And hypothesis is like, basically, um, what I really wanted to do with the readings was to get them to um, start to analyze these concepts and engage with each other and, and start to do some critical thinking. And there's uh, not really a lot of critical thinking you do with a multiple choice test about the reading that I have spent my valuable time trying to create, which is another whole thing. So the questions probably weren't even that good. Um, but the hypothesis really changed the game. So I started doing um, reading guides where I would post questions in advance and they would answer them in the annotations. Then I even moved to, um, as Jeremy was saying, pre-annotating, putting questions into the text itself so they would just reply to me. Um, it was a uh, uh, like really a game changer in terms of how they were not only just doing the readings in the first place, <laughs> but also like actually engaging with the material and engaging with each other. Um, and so hypothesis has been a, a really critical part of how I've moved all of my classes online. I, um, I started teaching online before COVID. So maybe it was already like a little bit more comfortable with some of the digital pedagogy stuff and the tools than um, some of the other folks I've been talking to because I work a little bit in faculty development as well, my many random jobs. <laughs> but um, I, uh, so what I've done now is I've taken all of my lectures and instead of delivering them as a video or a um, synchronous Zoom session, I just put it all into a blog and I have the students annotate the blog. So they're basically interacting directly with my lecture notes um, and I'm uh, corresponding with them throughout the week to answer their questions and to um, you know, uh, tell them that they're doing a good job and all this stuff. So giving them some sort of reaction. Um, and it's been really uh, awesome like to see the actual engagement a little bit more fluid than what I was doing um, before, which was just putting up slides in Canvas, having them answer a discussion post. Um, so everything was sort of like separate, disjointed and with Hypothesis, I've been able to put it all together. Um, and it's uh, it's been really great. Um, and then there's something else I do <laughs> that I wanted to to put in um, in this conversation. And I'll I guess I will share my screen. I'll show you all flowers annotating my talk in the chat box. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> Jeremy has a good riff about how chat and Zoom is a form of annotation. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I will um, give you a little preview of what I want to show you all. So I, I made this website this summer. Um, my, my field of expertise is Native American history. So I um, am teaching a class right now at UCSD called Native Americans and American Politics. And I, um, I, the, there was this huge Supreme Court decision this summer, the McGirt versus Oklahoma decision, which was a jurisdictional um, issue. And so I put the text of the opinion, Supreme Court opinion, into a website on Squarespace and then I embedded Hypothesis into the website. Whoa. Oh, because I'm so fancy now that I can copy and paste the free code. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, can, you should be able to share now too, if you want, <laughs> I found this setting. Yeah, okay, thank you. So wow, I'll, you're like a tech quiz. I am so fancy, seriously. No, I am not at all, but I'm a historian. <laughs> so this is what it looks like um, and it's a, so the annotations are basically embedded in the um, actual website itself. So I have my students who are, who I assigned this as a reading, basically they annotated the text, but they, I encourage them to do it um, in the public channel. So there's a whole lot more annotations in the public. So this, my idea with this is that it could be like a cross institutional, cross class conversation. So I teach at multiple institutions. So having students from different 
areas come together into one particular um, uh, source uh, is really exciting to me because you get these uh, conversations that will come up. And then even like assigning this again next year and seeing the different conversations that change based on the, um, the where we are at in the political sphere and people can respond to previous classes annotations, which I think is really cool um, and exciting. And I, I like that idea of just sort of expanding the scope of the conversation. Um, and I can stop sharing my screen right now, but uh, I'll put the link um, to the website in there. So one thing I did do this semester quarter, because um, I'm on both systems <laughs> at once, is um, I took my uh, hypothesis use outside of Canvas, which is like, um, I was really into the LMS app for a while. And then I ended up taking it out because I thought that there was a little bit more things I could do if I could like take it away from that, just that one class environment. And then I like the, um, the function that Hypothesis has where they'll send you a little note if somebody replies to your annotation. Um, so that's really kind of um, essential for the way that my class is set up. So that I get a note when somebody replies to my annotation and then they get a note when I reply to them. And so the conversation's really sort of sped up or um, prompted in that way, which I really like. Um, yeah, so that's all I have to say for now. And I can answer questions about my website. I'll just do a little self-promotion, throw my website in the chat so you guys can all see. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's really great. And um, Mary, let's, and if people do have uh, follow-up questions for Mary, let's take them now too, because I know she has to go in a little bit, but um, I wanted to start out. Um, and as I mentioned in the chat, my background is a little bit in history too. So that's why I'm always so excited to hear about you and your work. Um, although, I uh, never got my doctorate, unlike some people. So there you have it. <laughs> but at any rate, um, one of the things that um, you know you brought up here is this difference between using hypothesis in the learning management system environment versus sort of out on the public web the way you've done it, which is a really, I think, exciting and powerful use case, especially when you're um, trying to scaffold your students toward that kind of public engagement. You know. Um, uh, you know, uh, do, doing the intellectual work in public. Um, and I think there's a, a important space for that as well as a space to do it um, privately um, as you sort of build toward that more kind of public action. But I'm, I'm curious, um, uh, do, do you think that uh, in your work that you would continue to find um, a need to use both kind of hypothesis in both environments? Or do you think that you'll mostly be using it in the public environment? Oh, um, that's a good question. So I, I always give them like at the very beginning of the of the class, I give them the option to use a pseudonym in their hypothesis username. So as long as I know who they are, that's all that matters if they're because I say we're going to be learning in public. I mean, to an extent, I'm not sort of like driving traffic to my blog or anything, although I am kind of trying to drive traffic to my the McGirt website. But um, just well, now you're going to get new new visitors as of today, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, I give them the option of if they want to remain anonymous, if they're uncomfortable with that. Um, it's been like 90% of uh, people that I've uh, that, that have are comfortable with sharing their name and sharing their sort of, um, uh, you know, assessments of the reading in public. Um, but I, yeah, I do think that there is a place for just annotating like within the LMS as a class, um, especially if you're doing something like the syllabus or like the, these um, specific uh, tools that, are, that will shape the way your class plays out. Um, that there's no real need to put that out into the public sphere, <laughs> right? <laughs> like to get students to really respond to you, I think. But um, right, right. other than that, I don't think they, I don't think they care. I mean, they, I really have a lot of really honest um, annotations and real honest questions and reactions. And they're just sort of out there putting their, their thoughts out there, which is which is really cool. I think I like it. Yeah. And maybe that comes from me too, because I put emojis and like I swear a little bit and all that stuff. Like I just put my personality into the annotation, so. <laughs> yeah, and so it's kind of demonstrating how one can act in public, right? I know another um, <clears throat> deep annotation practitioner, Amanda LaCastro, who, um, has been at Stevenson University, and I think I, she'd be okay if I said this is moving to the University of Pennsylvania um, to take up a new position, talks about how she um, helps move students. She starts students out in a kind of private annotation space um, just to kind of like 
gear up and get used to the idea of annotation and, and what it what it's like and then she kind of brings them toward a kind of public annotation as they advance um so she kind of moves people across both system you know um erica asked in the chat mary um how you um if you assess annotations and how you go about that yeah um so usually I, it's a very low stakes assessment. I sort of treat it as, especially now, as class participation. So if they're annotating, they're, they're getting the full points. <laughs> There's no, like, I don't go in and evaluate the quality of their annotations just because um, depending on the size of the class, it's, it would be too much, too much work. I'd rather spend my time actually responding to them and sort of trying to draw them out if they're just annotating like one word. I give them like a, guidelines or benchmarks for what I expect. So I try to say, like, if you're going to comment on something that you find interesting, tell me why you find it interesting. If you want to comment on something that someone's already highlighted, reply to them so that you're trying to like engage them in conversation rather than just saying your thing and then moving on. Um, uh, this quarter semester, I, I tried uh, ungrading. So which is like, I've drank the ungrading Kool-Aid, everyone. You should all do it. It's amazing. I don't um, have to worry about entering the points because they do self-assessment. They just um, put in a little quiz. Did you do the annotations this week? Yes. Goes to the grade book and I trust them and it's awesome. <laughs> so that takes it away. <laughs> and I just really spend my time like actually reading what they have to say. Um, I was f finding that I do a lot of these like low stakes things in my classes and I was spending so much time with these like little things entering in points, points, points. And I was like, what is the what's the use of this? I was getting behind and overwhelmed. So um, I tried to just, I just burned it all down. <laughs> yeah. You know, I always felt when I was teaching that I loved giving feedback, but I didn't like grading. Oh yeah. And there's yeah. such a big difference. And yeah. uh, I think it sounds like your practice that you do with annotation is really about not just feedback, but just getting involved in the conversation with the students. Um, that's really great. So would you be, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but would you be willing to share um, your sort of guidelines um, that you give to students about? Um, um, yeah. That might um, be a useful thing you. for other people. No rush, you could put it in the chat whenever you have it or show it to us. Yeah, either way. Because um, I do put the benchmarks in Canvas. Um, so everything is linked through Canvas because I use the via proxy. That's the way I get them to all this <laughs> we can explain what that is later but it's a way of it's <clears throat> a complicated system of getting people to the document they're going to annotate right so i um i i i do that just because there's it takes away a step sorry i'm trying to multitask and get that's all right i can't talk and and click it <laughs> i we already saw it takes away a step for them like so i um try to make it so that they don't have to to download the extension, although sometimes that ends up being what they have to do depending on what they're annotating or depending on where like their system that they're using. But um, it's been, it works pretty well. Like I just link to it. And then since they've already created their username, it just um, just loads right for them. Um, let me show you. Yeah, and again, while Mary's doing that, I'll just point out that this is, you know, another one of the tensions between using the LMS app versus annotating out in the wild. Um, you know, in the LMS app, you don't have to create an account, you don't have to worry about getting the extension and so forth. And so there's some scaffolding there just around the technology, which can be a good way to get people started annotating and then later move to the public if you want. Yeah, um, I definitely find the the app in Canvas is so useful, especially to like introduce people to the whole, the whole process. Um, and I was using it before and I just sort of moved away. Some part of it was because my institutions are very slow to want to get the like join the, the program so yeah i gotta we, just do it myself <laughs> not your problem not your fault hey would you be willing to copy and paste some of that into the chat sure so this is kind of my basics um so they're really kind of general like because i copy and paste this every single week but um, i'll change it based on like um depending on if there's a special thing on that reading for that week. So this one is about the McGirt decision. Um, so then I just say engage with the majority of the text, connect with classmates. But then the real kind of guidelines come in the actual annotations when I'm um, asking them questions they can reply to that are specifically related to those readings. Um, but I'll copy and paste those general directions. So you um you then kind of pre-annotate the text like the McGirt decision. Um, yeah, I try. With prompts. Yeah, I um, and I do this especially with my survey classes. So the intros where I'm, I'm giving them readings that are much shorter, but they're usually all primary sources. So they're kind of tough to read depending on where they're coming from. So 
I'll give them direct questions. And then usually people just answer the direct questions and then sometimes they sort of reply to the replies and it, it becomes a little bit of a conversation there. Um, and that I felt like is helpful to help them figure out how to analyze the text because sometimes what I was noticing is that basically when you're taking notes, if you don't know how to take notes, which is a very, it's a skill that you sort of have to practice, um, you kind of just either write those short reactions or you write like a summary. And I wanted them to really uh, start to analyze. So that's what I started to do these reading guide questions. And I think so much of the annotation can be um, used as a tool to model scholarship and, you know, in for students or with students, um, you know, you know, like you say, analyzing primary text, a basic, a basic uh, sort of activity for historians, right, among other people as well, but all kinds of just like modeling reading scientific articles, for example, which which is a skill that has to be learned. I mean, I myself can barely read a scientific article um, without um, my eyes going buggy. And so annotation can really slow that down and break it up in interesting ways. Well, I, I would, I could talk to Mary all day, um, but, <laughs> um, and she, I thank you so much for sharing what you've shared. Uh, I really appreciate your coming. I know that you have um, some other things you have to do today. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say before we shift over and talk to Matt a little bit? Um, no, I'm excited to hear about the math. <laughs> so I will stop talking. Uh, yeah, I'll have to duck out in like 15 minutes, but I'll, I'll stay, stick around for a little bit longer. Okay, well, that will... I will give you time to hear most of what Matt has to say, I think so. Great. Well, so um, thank you, Mary. And now it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce I can't talk, introduce Matt Salamone. I think I got that right. Um, and uh, for uh, because we've met before. And um, he is um, math faculty and I believe chair at Bridgewater State. Uh, Bridgewater State in, um, in Massachusetts. Um, and is we're really excited by his work because he um, he annotates in math and uh, just that's not um, as widespread a practice outside of the humanities to do annotation, but growing uh, by leaps and bounds. We see a lot of STEM folks now getting involved. So um, I'll let Matt take it away and uh, let us know how he uses annotation uh, in his work. Sure, thanks, Nate. Um, thanks also to, to Jeremy and Franny for, uh, for having me here today and for putting this together. Um, so yeah, I do wanna say a little bit about how I use social annotation in my classrooms. But before I get there, I always feel like as a math faculty member um, that I have to make the case for why, why it's a social enterprise we're asking students to do in the first place, why we should prize reading skills and um, you know, sort of discussion-based discourse in mathematics. Um, so I actually, I have a, a couple of little slides and stuff that I'm just gonna share through my camera. Um, if that's all right. Uh, and Nate, I don't know if you want to, I don't, I don't think you'll need to because I'll still be talking. So probably everyone can see my video, but you could also spotlight it if you need to. Um, okay, so. we'll do. Yeah, we see you. Okay, great. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're always doing as, as math faculty members in college is we end up teaching a lot of students, particularly in general education, for whom they're having kind of their last formal exposure to school mathematics. Um, that we would like for it, first of all, not to be their last. We'd like to be able to make the sales pitch for them to continue their studies mathematically. Um, but second of all, you know, students come into mathematics with a lot of beliefs about the nature of the subject and the sort of the epistemological foundations of the discipline that are not particularly productive to collaboration and to social discourse. And, one of the things that I want to do, particularly if it's a student's last mathematical experience in the formal classroom, is to kind of convince them that it can be an experience that leverages the skills that they already have, can give them, uh, you know, an experience of being social and collaborating and constructing knowledge as part of a community. Um, because what people think math looks like, right, is that they think that it looks like this sort of received wisdom uh, handed down from on high on stone tablets. And they think that the process of doing mathematics is very solitary and it involves a lot of staring at, at blackboards with no actual English words on them, right? Um, in fact, you know, the, the classic story about Plato's uh, Academy is that there's an inscription over the door of Plato's Academy in, in the original Greek, uh, roughly translates to let no one ignorant of geometry enter, right? And so 
there's this belief that mathematics is this gatekeeping subject and functionally that is how mathematics has operated historically in education, um, both K-12 education and in higher education, that it's a subject that has been used to set up barriers. It's been used to exclude a lot of students from the educational enterprise. Um, and so you'll notice another thing too that is true about these what you think math looks like slides is that these are all, you know, white dudes <laughs> standing in front of this sort of mathematics. And so a lot of students really do struggle. And if you're watching this webinar, maybe you have in the past as well, to sort of see themselves as part of the discipline. Right? Where do I fit in mathematically? Um, and so the first thing that I have to do with my students is just to try to convince them that, that you can, you, the student, can be a part of math. Because in reality, what mathematics looks like when it happens in, in my college classrooms and in an increasing number of college classrooms, and, and more to the point, what it looks like when mathematicians practice mathematics as, as professionals, um, it looks very different, right? It is inextricably a social enterprise. We do mathematics together as part of a community. Um, you know, we're involved in a peer review process. You know, we, a theorem is not true because it's sort of handed down to us from some authority. It's true because, you know, our peers have reviewed it and said, yes, this, this meets our criteria, but that it's all a conversation. It's, it's a collaboration. It's inextricably social. And students want that, moreover, right? They want their experience of math learning to be more collaborative. They want to be in conversation with one another. They want to have, as we, as we think about in the, you know, sort of humanizing online learning, they want to have both a cognitive and instructional presence. They want to interact with me, but they also want to interact with one another. They want to learn in community. They want to be able to plug in their language skills into mathematics, but that's a struggle for a lot of students because A, a lot of math courses have not historically asked students to wrestle with actual close reading and critical reading and using that their own vernacular, right? Um, and also that that's, you know, kind of a, it's a skill that, you know, not only has it not been valued because it's not been valued by their previous math classes, it's something that we need to work on them to help to develop those reading skills. As Nate was saying, right, learn, reading, a mathematical text and extracting information from it. It's like reading a scientific journal article, right? It's a, it's sort of a domain specific skill um, that I want my students to come out of my classes uh, having developed and having had an experience of. Uh, so here's a little bit about how I do it. Um, so sometimes I do it in the LMS, um, sometimes in Canvas, as Mary was saying before, sometimes I've done it outside of the LMS. It really kind of, it depends semester to semester how much I'm actually using the LMS or not. Um, but I sort of provide students with some reading question guidelines, um, sort of what, what I find students are doing with the social annotation a lot is that they are asking questions um, and saying, hey, I read this passage, didn't really understand it, can somebody help me out? Um, and I just try to, you know, give them a framework that helps them to make those questions as specific uh, as possible, sort of let us know what kind of feedback are you looking for, that kind of thing. Um, and I also do a lot of encouraging my students to share other helpful resources uh, inside of these annotations, right? Um, to go out and research on the internet to find other resources that speak to the same material uh, and kind of say, oh, I found that this was really helpful. So my students do a lot of sharing of videos uh, and other links and sort of rich content inside of uh, the annotation space um, to really add value to what's already in the textbook. Um, and particularly now, that there's a lot of relatively new and really high quality open educational resources available uh, around especially introductory level college mathematics um, that you know it's really the material that's out there um, is more than sufficient for any student who needs to understand a particular area of math to find what they need if they don't find it in the textbook i've assigned them they go find it somewhere else and they tag it right into the annotation um, <clears throat> so i like to think of it as uh, there's a framework that Benjamin Dickman, he's a, a math teacher who's currently developing a social justice oriented algebra two curriculum for high school, which is a fascinating project. You can find him on, on Twitter at Benjamin Dickman. Um, but the framework that he likes to think of mathematical discourses happening in his classes is called notice, feel, wonder, and act. Right? These are the things I want my students doing when they engage with mathematics material. I want them to notice things. I want them to sort of acknowledge and experience the feelings and emotional part of doing mathematics, because let's face it, particularly with a lot of students who come into my classes with math anxiety and math avoidance, that they have a lot of 
uh, sort of emotional, they have an emotional discourse that happens with the, with the subject and not just an intellectual cognitive discourse. And so we want to give space for students to feel certain ways uh, around math as well. And I really want students wondering, right? I want them to try and anticipate the next steps and say, well, I, how does this connect with this other thing? Where is this going? I want those kinds of questions happening in the annotation. Um, and then fourth, action. So how is what I'm reading in my math textbook going to help to inform what I do next, uh, whether that's something I do in my life or whether that's something I do in my course to help me to learn later on. Um, so what I'm going to show you were just a couple of snippets and screenshots from my pre-calculus course uh, that I taught using social annotation last spring. Um, and so this is a course that was populated with mostly freshman and sophomore level students. Um, because it's pre-calculus, most of them are in the sciences and mathematics. I got a few students from the College of Business, but mostly these are STEM uh, students who often come in believing themselves to be sort of strong agents of mathematics, but not necessarily um, having command of language uh, and reading and, and writing and so forth. So I'm, I like to think that this was also a, a way to help to, uh, to build those skills with them as well. So on the notice side, what I saw students doing um, is that they'll sort of consume a theorem and say, well, is this, I, I noticed that this theorem means this thing to me. This is how I'm reading it. Is this how other people are reading it and experiencing? Can I understand it in this way? Um, one of the things that's true about a lot of mathematical and scientific writing, I think mathematical in particular, um, is that, you know, a lot of authors are very terse. They'll say in one or two sentences what probably would take a paragraph or two to really fully explicate. Um, and so the more we can get students to notice what's in the writing and to add to it in the margins, um, the more that they begin to understand what it is to read a mathematical text and to unpack the, the large amounts of meaning that are hidden in small amounts of prose. Um, one of the feeling things that I noticed, so this student says something interesting. I've always found the vertex formula for parabolas amusing. Um, I want more of my students to find mathematical ideas amusing uh, the way that this, uh, this student did. Um, but she found it amusing because of the different connections she was able to make between this particular part of it and the other ways of understanding. So her sort of mental scaffold was filling in. She was making connections between different parts of the material um, and that that was that was a good feeling for her, right? And so I want her to be able to experience and validate those feelings, but I also want the other students in the class to see, hey, you know, mathematics can be a, 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 an experience that's full of, of positive emotions in addition to the ones that you might have brought into the classroom. So the feeling step, I think, cannot be shortchanged, should not be shortchanged in the process. Um, then there's the wondering element. This is probably my favorite one of the four uh, because this is really, I think the most what it, what I feel mathematics research is for me when I you know do scholarship as a mathematician is it's full of this sort of wonderment right where you have a mathematical idea in front of you and say well I wonder if it works this way I wonder if this thing is true um, because the fact is as a mathematician you know the the theorems that we discover and we prove right we we get this gut feeling that they're true long before we actually have a proof that they're true and so most of what i do as a mathematician is is wonderment um, and then from that wonderment trying to chase down whether whether or not my my suspicions are actually true or not so this student says well would this definition i'm reading of a function also apply for an inverse function does it also work this other way right so kind of pushing beyond the boundaries of, of what's in the text um, to other ways of interpreting our, our next steps that students might go to um, and then there's the action step so I, I thought this annotation here was a good example of an action oriented one um, so the student reads this paragraph about uh, about transformations sort of gives some practical strategic advice for how to do a particular mathematical task, student says, well, you know, should I just use this as my strategy? Is this, is every example going to work this way so that I don't have to, you know, expend a lot of cognitive load trying to figure out what framework to fit the next set of examples in? Can I take this to the bank and run with it, right? Um, to me, that's kind of an action-oriented uh, way of experiencing the text. Um, so that's as much as I want to say, and I want to leave some space for, for questions, but I really find that the experience I want for my students to have of each other and of the material and the experiences with me are collaborative, they're conversational, they're social, um, because that's how I experience mathematics as a professional. It's how I want my students to experience it as students as well. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. So, so great, Matt. And, you know, every time you talk, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I'd continue to study math more because you really uh, inspire me. Never I went too through, late. <laughs> I, went, I went through Calc 2 and then I just gave it up. And so uh, 
that was, I felt like humanities were for a better fit for me. But um, I, one question that I had, and I think I brought this up last time we talked is I had a math teacher um, in high school actually, who made the argument that he thought math was taught backwards in the sense that uh, students are taught all the boring hard stuff first. And then you don't get to the interesting mathematical questions until way later when you're probably sick and tired of math and have decided you hate it for a lot of people at any rate. And I'm wondering what you think about that, this idea, like almost like introducing the concepts of calculus and, and geometry and stuff at the beginning, and then let the, the arithmetic and algebra come when necessary. You know? Yeah, and it's funny because I feel like a lot of sort of more specialized higher level courses in math are often taught in that way, high concept, right? Um, that we sort of see, hey, here's the here's the end point that we're working towards. And then now let's try to backfill everything that we need in order to, to get there, right? So you at least give students a sense of, of where you're going before you start embarking to go there. Um, but I think that there's another way that I can interpret uh, what you're saying. And that is that mathematicians as such, right? Those of us who you know, go into a math major and they do sort of higher study in mathematics, what you find out is that the enterprise of mathematics becomes increasingly more creative and open-ended the higher that you climb up in the curriculum. Um, and I want students to have that creativity experience sooner, right? I want them to have that right away, right? Um, there's a classic text in, in mathematical circles called uh, Lockhart's Lament, it's written by a mathematician named Paul Lockhart, uh, which is really great reading. And it is, a, it is a sort of a lamentation of a mathematician that why are we teaching K-12 students in particular um, in these ways of mathematics that are very doctrinaire and they're very sort of you know, put into a box and compartmentalized? Why are we not encouraging more creative exploration? Why are we snuffing out students' creative sparks in the math classroom? Um, so I really think there is something to that. Because um, one of the things I love about my discipline is how creative it is to do research in mathematics. And that is not the experience that a lot of students have with it, particularly in the earlier grades. Um, and so no wonder that they don't see themselves in my discipline, if that's how they're experiencing it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's maybe more true in math than in, in some other subjects, but it's kind of true in every discipline, right? That a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the creativity and interest is saved for the end after you right, right. do all the hard work of, of like, you know, um, getting, getting footnote format right and, and things like that that are actually not like the most necessarily the most important or exciting part of, um, say, history, for example, like in Mary's discipline. Well, do folks have um, other questions for, for Matt? I, I again, uh, just love talking to him myself, so I kind of forgot everybody else was here. <laughs> Uh, you can put them in the chat if you have other questions or if any of our other panelists have a question they wanted to or a observation they wanted to to Matt. I think people have been commenting on your great uh, sharing setup, which. <laughs> so I, I'm going to actually uh, have to look into this doing it with Zoom because I actually don't do it with Zoom. I do it with a separate software package um, that does all my compositing. but. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna look up this. This might be a better way for me to recommend this strategy to my colleagues. Something that's a little easier, maybe. Yeah, I, I really appreciate how your setup also um, does automatic, um, you know, text captioning. That's, that's a good yeah. I'm just using Google Slides for that, which I noticed yeah. you do too. But yeah, yeah, and I hadn't flipped it on. I've had a different experiences with how well it works, but yeah, it's better than nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Great. Oh, it's. Uh, so the, what they're talking about, it's uh, it's beta and Zoom. Interesting. Yeah, we should all try that out because it. Um, I definitely think it makes for a more more um, effective presentation style. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I really appreciate your being here, and if uh, welcome to stick around. Obviously, um, for the rest of the day, it's so great to have different perspectives here at the table. I do want to spend um, just a minute. Um, uh, to invite uh, another uh, practitioner up here on stage, and that's um, Ramey Kalir from University of Colorado, Denver. Um, as I mentioned before, Ramey, uh, we just brought Ramey on at Hypothesis as our first scholar in residence um, to head up some work on um, formal research into social annotation. Um, and so Ramey, if you're here, I know we didn't have a chance to do a sound check with you. Good morning, good morning. Yes, you're Folks here. hear me okay? I'm here. Yes, welcome. Lovely to see folks and colleagues and friends. I hope everyone is doing well. Yeah, so take it away. Tell us a little bit about what you're up to. <laughs> yeah, let me keep it pretty high level and short. Um, first of all, it's really um, been a really a pleasure to hear from Mary and from Matt this morning. And thanks again to Hypothesis colleagues um, and also everyone who's watching this morning. I, I just really appreciate the energy 
and the enthusiasm around social annotation and how social annotation is being used to support student learning in a whole variety of disciplines and contexts. Briefly, um, day to day, I am a assistant professor of learning design and technology at the University of Colorado in Denver, um, but really have the great honor this year of serving as the inaugural scholar in residence um, at Hypothesis. And um, I think a, a link has been uh, shared in our chat, um, kind of introducing that program and the goals um, of, of this new initiative. And the, really the guiding rationale behind um, my, my role now with Hypothesis um, as the scholar in residence is to further promote and further investigate the important relationship between social annotation and learning. Uh, if you're joining this uh, webinar session, if you're hearing from folks like Mary and Matt and others, there's at this point um, no doubt that social annotation productively aids student learning. Um, that there is very little uh, <laughs> at this point, you know, doubt that when students are annotating, when they're reading together, when they're making sense of uh, discipline specific texts, when they're collaborating by reading and writing together through annotation, they're learning and they're learning in some pretty dynamic and very interesting ways. And there is now a real wealth of scholarship specific to hypothesis and also specific to other social annotation technologies that really does evidence that productive relationship between social annotation and learning. And so my role briefly is to help not only to promote that work and make that work more publicly accessible, but to also start new research projects and new investigations into how specifically those types of productive learning relationships can exist. And so we're beginning to now launch some new research projects at a number of universities and with a number of other educators and researchers who are really eager to help really move the field forward, but also, of course, at the end of the day, support student learning and student success. Um, so I'm happy to, uh, again, either share a little bit more about that program. I, of course, have my own history using social annotation and specifically hypothesis in my own courses um, with my own graduate students. Um, I also am involved with a number of other projects that help to support the broader um, kind of open infrastructure around social annotation, whether that's through professional development opportunities or through online tools, whatever that may be, I'm very eager to help build a robust open ecosystem of educators and technologists and researchers who are all contributing to the field of social annotation and how that supports student learning. So I'll keep my short comments there, but I'm happy to address any questions that come up um, or just you know, hear people's thoughts and reflections as this discussion moves forward this morning. Thank you so much, Remy. Um, uh, I put a link in the chat to a blog post we made when, when Remy joined as scholar in residence, um, and that has a link on it to a different page, which is I'll also share, which is um, kind of talks about the research program that um, he's leading in general. Um, and, you know, what we're really excited about here is to set up a kind of um, repeatable practice around um, kind of formal research into social annotation. Um, and uh, we'll be kicking off the kind of first formal projects, like Ramey said, uh, in the spring term winter spring term uh, and so we're really excited about that and then there will be opportunities for I mean there's just research now popping out of the woodwork um, one of the things that um, Ramey's also been working on is a collected bibliography of different research works we have the start of that as well it's linked to from um, from the links that I put in chat so you can start to explore that, that but that will continue to expand as things move forward as well so at any rate I mean you know one thing that's clear I mean even just from listening to Mary and Matt like Ramey said is uh, you know, we, we we can already tell how powerful social annotation is. We don't we don't necessarily need quantitative research in order to prove that to ourselves, but it's also an important thing to do to explore more deeply uh, the different ways that that it can affect us. Uh, so um, I, I want to thank you so much for popping in, Ramy, and um, I now I know that we've been talking at you all for a lot, and um, this is a workshop, and so one of the things that we wanted to do is get um, get interactive and, and spend some time um, actually doing some annotation ourselves. Um, and so uh, before we start the second half of our show here, I think it's time um, if anybody needs to like pop out and get some more coffee, um, get some water, you got to stay hydrated. Um, if you want to um, 
go to the bathroom or do any of those human needs, um, now would be a good time to do it. Um, I'm just gonna um, get us set up to um, start annotating with flower, as we like to say, um, by um, reminding people how they can um, make sure that they are already enabled themselves to annotate. So I'm just gonna talk about that for a couple minutes. Um, uh, so if you step away uh, and you are already set up to annotate in hypothesis, you don't need, you won't be missing anything because you're already set up. Um, yes, Marie, we 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 will be saving the chat um, or at least um, sharing out in that blog post that you signed up for. You know all the links and interesting resources from it. Um, maybe take away all my dumb jokes, um, but so the good parts of the chat will be will be saved and published, and you'll get an email when that's um, published with the recording from today. This is a page um, that kind of uh, just describes briefly what we're about to embark and do, which is um, we picked a text, well, Flower has picked a text, thank you, Flower, and we're going to um, annotate it together, much like, um, you know, Mary and Matt described how they do it with their students um, as an exercise in kind of our own professional development, right? And so um, Flower's picked a text that relates to the themes of her keynote. Um, uh, at, at OLC Accelerate, and we'll have her talk about that in just a second. But first, I want to make sure that people who maybe haven't annotated with Hypothesis before are, are set up. And so um, one of the first things to do um, is to uh, equip yourself with a Hypothesis account. You actually won't need to install anything like a, an extension or anything today, but you will at least need an account in order to um, to join in the annotation part. So if you haven't done it yet, um, take a few moments, moments to follow that link in the uh, that I just put into the chat um, and make sure that you're signed up for a, a hypothesis account so that you can annotate in the wild, um, what we say on the, uh, in the wild across the public web. Um, and uh, we'll, you'll, that's an account, of course, that you'll be able to use for annotation for any purpose um, ongoing and just to, Underline again, it's a little bit different than what happens inside the LMS context um, when you're using Hypothesis there, because that's a single sign on environment with the LMS. So this is sort of like equipping yourself with Hypothesis to work outside the LMS, right? Um, so uh, I want to make sure people um, get a chance to do that in advance. Um, and then uh, um, just to be really clear here, right? The act of annotation, um, as we'll be demonstrating for you, is you highlight something and that pulls up an opportunity for you to decide if you want to just highlight it privately for yourself or if you want to add an annotation to share. Um, that annotation could be private also just to yourself as a note to yourself, or it could be shared, um, like Mary mentioned, either publicly or privately. Um, and then, of course, each annotation exists as the beginning of what could be a threaded discussion, right? So if somebody else has annotated something, you can reply to it as we've seen. And so that's part of what we can be doing today is not only making new annotations ourselves, but also replying to other people's annotation. And so um, I'd like to uh, um, be quiet there for a sec and um, before we actually dive into the document itself, and I'll pull it up on my screen so you can watch what I'm doing too, but I'd like to give Flower a chance to introduce herself, say a little bit about who she is, why she's here, um, and um, kind of give us a preview of the text that she selected, why she picked it out, and what she's thinking about it. Welcome, Flower. Hi, Nate. Thank you so much for having me here today, and thanks to everybody who's made the time to be here. I really appreciate it. Sorry, do you want me to just go ahead and talk a few minutes about what we're doing, why I chose this text. Yeah, okay. See, we're very authentic here. That's what I like about this event today. <laughs> Rolling with the punches. So, um, so right, my keynote that I have prepared to deliver on Monday for OLC Accelerate is um, focused on the power that we have when we use really innovative technology and when we pair that with really effective teaching, how much we can empower students to engage and learn. I, my own personal experience working in ed tech field and instructional design, I think many of us, although I'm, I'm going to say maybe not those of us who are here today, but many of us working in this area really do focus a lot on the technology and the tools and what can we do. And to be fair, this is a workshop about a technology tool that we can use. But I think sometimes the conversation doesn't focus enough on what we're doing to actually teach our students. And I was quite inspired by Matt's comments about we need to kind of change the conversation and the experience that students are having. So, um, so anyway, in recent months, that, that's basically the gist of my, of my talk is how do we uh, empower students through really great technology like Hypothesis 
and also through really great teaching. Uh, my thinking has, of course, I hope like many of us, like all of us, it's been really impacted by the events of the last six to eight months. And so um, I have a focus on how do we use technology to teach equitable and inclusive classes as well, and um, supporting the students that we know uh, had faced more challenges in the big pivot online, and then uh, whose situations are compounded and, and even more complicated and complex as a result of Black Lives Matter and the sort of the renewed energy around racial tensions and such that we've experienced after the death of George Floyd. So those, those issues together, that's where I want to really think deeply about how do we teach well, how do we use tech well, and how do we address the systemic inequities that are oppressing uh, so many of our students and what can we do to support them. So this text that I selected I will be referring to it briefly in the keynote, it certainly won't be in as in depth as we'll get into here. It's hearing from the students themselves. And I think that's another overlooked piece, or sorry, I should say overlooked piece. Um, when we get together and we talk about, well, here's the things that we can do. And many times faculty um, are not necessarily thinking about the students lived experience. Again, I'm gonna qualify that right now and say, well, not those of us who are here, but uh, in general, I think we could do better to listen to more from the students themselves. And so I like this uh, summary report of research that took place with 13 different focus groups of students all around the country from underrepresented, underrepresented and uh, marginalized student groups, um, just to see what, what are they saying they need and how can we therefore help? So that's a little bit of an introduction to why I'm here in the text that I chose. That's so great, Flower. And um, I really, um, I know that it's kind of a tricky situation to say, hey, before you give your keynote, how would you like to come on and like talk about it and give all the interesting tidbits away? No, just kidding. Um, I'm sure actually um, sort of like other educators um, use reading to set up more interesting discussion in class. I think the work right. we hear do today will make us like better participants in your keynote um, when it happens sure. on Monday, right? Yeah, so for folks who are attending um, OLC Accelerates, um, um, Flower will be giving both a, a keynote and a plenary closing session. Um, and I believe at least the closing plenary is open to the wider public as well. I'm not sure about the keynote. We can double check that in the background, but um, if, if you aren't, uh, just a little plug for OLC, if you aren't attending already, <clears throat> you can still register and the, the cost of it is very low this year. It's all virtual, all online environment. There's all sorts of really exciting things happening there, including more interesting stuff um, uh, with social annotation, uh, as well as like a host of other things. So it's, it's, it's a worthy, a worthy conference to get involved in. It goes on for the next two weeks, believe it or not. I don't know what it is about, about uh, the pandemic time, but it's, I guess we've decided that conferences that used to only last a couple of days or a week are now going to be extended over like a whole month. So um, so at any rate, um, without further ado, I put a link there in chat to the document that um, that Flowers picked out. And I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen again for a second, um, uh, just so that you can see, uh, see what it looks like uh, for me. And so first of all, um, just a couple of things to orient you to, right? The document is here on the left. It's a PDF. Um, like Flower said, uh, and you can see it has, uh, I think it's about 30 some odd pages long, 33 pages long, right? Um, and there have been a couple annotations made already on it. Um, so I, I made this first annotation just to the very top to kind of orient everyone and make sure there was something on it. And, um, and let me uh, actually refresh the screen. Um, and then Flower has added uh, an annotation of her own too. You can see there, um, She's got um, a video embedded in her annotation just to show how that's possible. And then she started to add some other things as well. And um, another thing, the link that I shared in chat, just so you know, every um, document on uh, when you're annotating publicly like this, um, you'll, you'll have this little button of the, the little box with the arrow in it. And that provides you with a link that leads you to that document with annotation enabled on top of it. So even for people who may not already have their browser equipped with hypothesis or whatever, you can share a link like this with them and they will be able to get to the document and start annotating without going through any other steps as long as they, they have an account. Um, that 
that is also true for every annotation. So every annotation is a kind of an addressable space on the web. So for instance, if you wanted to share flowers annotation here with the video, right, there's that same little box with an arrow icon on that annotation. And that pulls up a specialized link that will lead anyone directly to the document um, and with flowers annotation sitting right beside of it, and they could get started interacting and, and reading or, or responding to or annotating themselves. So I just wanted to point that out, like when Jeremy said that each annotation is like a little mini web page, it's literally is a web page in the sense that it has a web address. Um, each annotation is kind of an addressable space on the web, like it was its own little web page. And so you can um, share links to them. So I just want to make sure that people um, see that and know about it. And so um, I'll give Flower another chance to, to weigh in here too. But um, now is our time to actually go through this relatively um, uh, rich document. Uh, it has a lot of really interesting information in it and um, start to uh, have a discussion on top of this document um, by means of annotation. And so you could start that out um, right by replying to one of the existing annotations. So if I wanted to reply to what um, this video that Flower shared out here, I could, you know, begin a threaded conversation right below it. Um, or I could move through the document myself as I'm reading, highlight some text, and that will bring up a little interface here where I can choose to either annotate or highlight. Highlights would, again, just be private to me, but if I hit the annotate button, then I've got a little space where I can say what I want to say about the text that I've selected. So let me give Flower another chance to, if she has anything else she wants to say before I uh, shut up and let people read in, in peace. Um, but also, um, if people do have questions, um, we could certainly uh, we could certainly address them if, if anybody's brought up anything in chat. I'm just pulling it up for myself. Did you want to say anything else, Flower? Uh, thank you, Nate. I, I don't know that I had um, anything else specifically to add. I'm, I am curious to people's reactions, um, about people's reactions to this reading. And I'm curious about how we talk and read at the same time. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, I mean, that is going to be one of the interesting things about this workshop, right, is um, like Jeremy was saying, we're going to do some synchronous annotation, right? And so basically, I'm <clears throat> as soon as we can get me to shut up, I will be quiet and then just allow everybody to start reading and start adding annotations. I do want to draw your attention to one other little thing in the interface here. And that's um, when there are new annotations that have been added to the document that you're not seeing yet, there will be a little red icon will appear up here at the top. And um, if you click on that little red icon, it will load the new annotations that weren't there already into the into the side panel. So you don't need to keep refreshing the page to get new annotations. As soon as you see that little red icon, that means there's new annotations. So, so far, no one has added any yet because I don't have that little red, that little red indication. Um, but if anybody has any sort of questions about the mechanics or te technical side of, of doing this annotation, feel free to, um, to put, it, put a note in chat and we'll address that. Um, but otherwise, I'm just gonna be quiet and I myself am gonna start I'm doing some reading and annotation. I'm gonna leave my screen shared so you can see what I'm doing if you want, but you might wanna just follow the link in chat and go pull up the document in a different space so that you don't aren't distracted by my reading, if you will. And so we can all do that and we'll spend um, maybe about, let's go about 15 minutes or so doing some reading and then we can come back again uh, and start talking about uh, what we've all been reading. Hey everyone, it's Nate again. I know we've been spending a little time reading and I, I wanna apologize um, that not the entire document doesn't have selectable text in it as we've been discussing in the chat. Um, it's interesting because it did yesterday. <laughs> um, so uh, I kind of worked hard to do some extra backflips to make sure that the document was fully annotatable and um, seems to have reverted in the night. So uh, my apologies for that, um, we'll look into it. But as we've been discussing in chat, Obviously, one of the key things here is that um, <clears throat> this is a rather complex PDF with a lot of images and so forth, and it was produced in such a way that it, uh, actually all the text wasn't um, embedded into the PDF as selectable text. Um, the publishers did take some extra steps to make it accessible, like to screen readers, 
but the steps that they took didn't also make the text selectable on the screen in all cases. Um, we thought we'd worked around it, but apparently we didn't fully. So I apologize, we're only able to annotate um, sort of the first section and that's why our annotations are kind of um, kind of concentrated in that. So my apologies, especially to Flower for that. Um, because it's a really rich text and a lot of that, a lot of the really interesting points in it are in those later pages, I think. So, um, and um, if anybody is sort of begging the question, like, why can't we just annotate images? Well, <clears throat> that's a feature that um, Hypothesis doesn't have built into it yet. It's something that we want to do. And it has to do with the difference between anchoring annotations on an image versus anchoring annotations on a text selection, which are sort of different anchoring sort of uh, uh, problems to solve on the technical level but it is something that we, we do plan to do um, in the future. So this will become less of a problem then in the sense that one will be able to annotate images, but that doesn't take away that the fact that images in general aren't fully accessible. And so um, something to think about um, as, you know, and this is something to think about whether you're annotating or not, right? If you're using PDFs um, as, you know, as class readings, you know, ensuring their accessibility is, is an essential uh, part of a uh, part of signing a PDF and there can be um, hitches along the road as we're experiencing today. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, so I see uh, D Beeman has asked about sharing the document outside of the context of hypothesis. So uh, yeah, we can share a link to that. But just so you know, you can also share the link uh, with with anyone uh, with the hypothesis embedded as well. Um, but um, I will navigate to it uh, for you. Um, it's published by <clears throat> Every Learner Everywhere. And so this is their page um, that publishes the document and then you can download the PDF version of it right here. Um, and again, we, we were uh, in conversation with Every Learner Everywhere about um, trying to make a, a more fully accessible version of the document. Um, Maybe I'll invite Flower, if she uh, feels okay about this, to come back uh, on, on to audio here and share a little bit about how this annotation experience has gone for her so far. Yeah, thank you, Nate. It's been very interesting. And I, uh, I'll go ahead and confess that this is my very first opportunity to annotate socially with hypothesis. I've heard about this. In fact, I've actually written about it, um, but uh, had never actually tried it myself. And so I, I knew that it was a good thing sort of intuitively and experiencing it here together as the conversation, I think has so much potential and power, even with the limitations that we kind of experienced today. And I, I, I thought that was the case, Nate, you said it was fully accessible yesterday and I, and it was, I don't know what happened overnight, but yeah, I don't um, either. <laughs> I'm going to blame the internet. Apologies. There we go. Let's, let's, oh, let's blame the pandemic. That's good. Yeah, it's the oh, pandemic for sure. <laughs> yes. But I think all, all, um, experienced instructors need to know how to sort of improvise and go with the flow when I mean it, 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 here's another lesson right teaching with technology something is bound to go wrong that is just you just need to plan for that and anticipate it and so it's been really interesting to see how the conversation has developed and flowed even even though we couldn't uh, fully access all of the parts of the text so this has been my inaugural experience with hypothesis and it's really lived up to my expectations I'm thrilled with how this has gone I really appreciate people's engagement with it as well yeah, and just to everybody's point, I mean, engagement doesn't need to stop here, right? So um, we will be, uh, you know, kind of sharing what happened at this workshop more widely too. And so other people will be able to visit this document, see your annotations, mm -hmm. respond to them, and also make annotations themselves. Um, uh, and then as we were discussing with DBM in there in chat, um, there's a link to go get the document yourself. And here is the kind of amazing thing about hypothesis that I still feel is a little bit like black magic, but if you download the PDF and open it up on your in your browser and you have Hypothesis enabled in your browser locally on your computer, um, right now that's only possible in Chrome to do this, uh, to read a PDF locally um, with Hypothesis. But you just have the, the file on your desktop and you open it in Chrome and, and enable Hypothesis. The annotations that we added here today will appear for you locally on your computer as well, which is it's kind of amazing um, because what it really is underneath everything, it's the same PDF file and the annotations are hooked to um, something that's embedded in that file called a fingerprint 
sort of a unique um, kind of fingerprint for that PDF file. And so no matter where that file is annotated, the annotations find each other and can appear. Um, so <clears throat> there's the possibility of, um, of annotating this in other environments as well. So this link to it here, um, which is embedded in the slides that we shared with you, and we can share those slides again if you don't, if you haven't been already getting to them, will always lead you back to this this version of it where it's enabled with Hypothesis, and you don't need to get your browser all equipped and everything, um, or you can download the PDF and and use it in other environments as well. Um, and I'm, I'll continue my conversation with the ELE about uh, about making it more fully accessible. <laughs> yeah, you're so right, Flower. So have so you've uh, had to roll with some uh, some. Um, some surprises in your teaching. Do you have any thoughts about uh, how you approach that? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, again, both in my teaching and in, and in my work supporting faculty as an instructional designer as well, I have learned that you need to have plan B when you have you know something that you're going to do when you're teaching with technology, but it's also a good idea to have plan C, D, and E and uh, just be ready um, I've really come to value this idea of improvisation in our teaching, and in fact, I've, I've begun um, engaging in improvisational exercises as a, as a sort of a personal creative practice, because good teachers respond to what's happening in the moment there, whether that's the people who that we're working with right in front of us, or whether it's uh, something that we're having to respond to in terms of the technology, or or maybe it was maybe it wasn't even the technology, maybe just the plan that we made for class that day just bombed and it went terribly. That happens to the educators all the time um, if we're honest about it. So learning how to uh, roll with those punches and um, be able to respond, I think, is a really key element for for instruction. And it, it again, it it demonstrates that kind of compassion that we were talking about, where we. Uh, recognize if something is not serving our students well, and and we modify our own approach. We're we're willing to change. We're willing to admit maybe something didn't go wrong. There's a there's a degree of humility and vulnerability that goes into really great teaching as well. So, yeah, and I mean, for instance, like something might be happening in the wider world that is happening in the moment of class that one has to uh, sort of at least recognize as maybe affecting people's lives. You know, like it's a severe weather event. That it Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I've been thinking a lot about this because um, the new project that I'm working on right now is responding. Um, part of it is about responding to the emotional climate. And I was really intrigued by what Matt was saying earlier about how people feel about math and, and sort of giving them space to work through that. But I've been reflecting on an experience that I had uh, teaching in 2001, September 11th. Um, I was teaching that day. And uh, as it happens, people may not know this about me, but I also teach dance. And I was teaching a really high energy dance class that day and I didn't know what to do with the with the tragedy that was happening in the entire country and the weight and the oppression that was everybody was dealing with and I in that moment and to be fair that's almost 20 years ago I'm, I'm wiser now but in that moment I was like okay we're just not even gonna we're just not that's not even happening we're here in class right now and, and looking back I don't think that was right I think it would have been better to uh, respond to, in that case, what was a national tragedy and the fact that it was impacting everybody in the room. And I was trying to pretend it wasn't, and that wasn't really effective. So responsiveness, flexibility, adaptability, I think these are really important things to to be okay with, even if it's a little uncomfortable. Yeah, so it's like, um, in order to be more sensitive to the situation that our students are in, we need to give ourselves mm -hmm. the space to be more vulnerable and open as well, right? One yeah, 100%. And even right now, in this particular moment, we have faculty all across the country trying to learn how to teach more in this kind of a format, that this was not really a thing before March 2020, the synchronous online teaching in Zoom, this kind of thing. And I, I know many faculty, maybe some who are here today, are frustrated, are struggling, are tired, quite frankly. Um, and I've, I've been working with faculty telling people, uh, whoever will listen to me, let's, let's give ourselves some grace. Let's be patient. This is new. We, we didn't set out to learn how to teach this way. This came unexpected. I do believe with practice, we get better with whatever the, the experience that we're trying. I was listening to both Mary and Matt and kind of listening to how they've evolved their practice with hypothesis in ways that, you know, they're doing things now that I bet they didn't do the first semester they started teaching with hypothesis. And I would argue we'll be doing the same thing right now in this moment if Zoom teaching continues to be a thing. And I, I suspect it will in some form or other, uh, to some extent or other, I should say. 
um, you know, we need to give ourselves that grace, be willing to admit that we're learning and, and the students really respect that, that, that uh, when they can come into our learning journey with us, that really helps as well. Yeah, and I know we're, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, I know we went a little off topic. I'm, I'm just waxing <laughs> philosophical now about my, my opinions about great teaching <laughs> and how do we support our students. Well, I think, I mean, that's part of the reason why, um, you know, we wanted to have you as a part of the workshop was because that is your focus. Um, presumably, you're going to be talking about that in your keynote. It's obviously part of your written, your written works as well. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think in the background here is, um, I know a lot of the students that I've interacted with have complained about the Zoom, the move to Zoom, in the sense that it seems like everything now is just like, let's have this synchronous meeting, right? When there are so many other things that could happen, maybe asynchronously to set up more valuable experiences when you're together. Yeah, that's that that was resonating. Now I don't quite remember if it was Mary or Matt, or maybe they both sort of said something. Uh, but maybe it was Jeremy. Come to think of it, but the idea of <laughs> using of that asynchronous everybody the whole yeah. the whole conversation, how we use that asynchronous interaction, and how that's actually richer. Because look what's happening here, Nate. We're having a nice conversation, and these kind people are willing to hang around and listen, but we're kind of talking over each other a little bit. I think that's one of the most awkward things about Zoom is that it doesn't handle that audio talking over each other thing. But in that written form, we can more fully you know, develop our thoughts and we can add that richness with those videos, with those links to other resources, with those memes. I loved that screenshot of the students placing memes into the comments. I was trying to be clever enough today to do that and nothing really came to mind. But uh, maybe later I'll go back to the document. <laughs> yeah, you have to be in the right mood to, to meet, right? Yeah. You know, and so I wanted to, um, maybe this is a good spot too, because we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I'm going to put another link in chat here. And so one of the ways that we got to know both Mary and Matt was through a show that we produce called Liquid Margins. Where we invite educators on to do this kind of exploration and conversation just generally. There's actually another one coming up yet today that is, again, um, specifically focused on this question of how to create what um, the presenters call hospitality in a course environment. And so um, this Liquid Margins episode that's coming up later today um, is with Mahabali, Mia Zamora, and Autumn Keynes. Um, and I'm, I see Flower knows their work. Um, <laughs> big thumbs up, right? I, I've also found myself doing that a lot because of Zoom. It's like a lot of gestures. Right. Like, Right. Kind of scary sometimes, but um, so I invite anyone who's interested, I don't want to take you away from the other stuff you may be doing in, in conjunction with OLC or whatever, but we do have that other, uh, if you haven't had enough sitting around watching interesting things about annotation on Zoom today, um, there's that liquid margin coming up. So, um, you know, we're, we are just about out of time and I want to give Flower a chance to, to have the last word here. Um, uh, <laughs> Is there any, you know, as you look ahead to your keynote, um, is there anything about this experience uh, today that you think might change what you were going to say? You may have it all locked and loaded. Well, no, I, it's a good question, and I'm going to punt and say I don't know yet. Um, so you, you know, in our preparations for this event, you mentioned that previous OLC keynotes have sort of brought in some of this interaction into the keynote, and that's the advantage of doing this before. I don't know yet. It's certainly not all locked and loaded. There's still time for some uh, updating. So I thought if nothing else, I might put the hypothesis logo on a slide. I might do that. No. Oh, well, <laughs> just kidding. That, that's too much to ask for. Don't don't worry about that. We're not we're not in it for the promotion at all. So um, I want to we, reflect on the on the experience that we've had here. I'm I'm definitely a reflector, right? So let me let me give that some thought over the next day or two, and we'll see on Monday um, how how uh, yeah. No. Well, no pressure. Fair. <laughs> no pressure at all. Yeah, <laughs> it was actually uh, Mahabali who will be at the Liquid Margins, who was the previous keynote yes. who brought the brought it yeah. into her keynote. But she was doing a kind of experimental keynote to begin with that was kind of crowdsourced in a in a kind of a strange way. So Ooh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> at any rate, mm -hmm. well, thank you, uh, Flower, so much for being here for picking this text. Um, thank you, everybody who attended. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm back to Matt and Mary and Jeremy also for speaking with us. Really appreciate it. We will be, um, we recorded this obviously. We'll do a kind of edited version because a lot of it was just like watching Nate's screen, probably not that interesting, but we'll edit it up. Um, we'll gather all the links that were shared in chat and everybody who attended or was a panelist will get an email um, with links to those resources. It'll all be hosted on that same uh, blog post where you first signed up for this. So um, really appreciate everybody being here. Thank you, Flower. Thank you, Nate. Thanks everybody.